Good afternoon. Or is it evening? It's always difficult to come after two brilliant uh, speakers. But I must say they've made my job much easier um, because they've talked about the issues that I'm going to highlight. I think if anything happens, the lights go off and all of that, the main thing I want you to go away with is that it's possible, it can be done. That's what I'm going to try and share with you as to how we did that in Botswana. As part of my disclosure, I wear a few hats that are noted there, so I'm not going to go into them. I have one disclosure, um, which is there, and I would like to take us over the next 20 minutes as to how we go to where we are. And I think it's important as we look at how to get to the last, um, uh, the last mile, as they put it, we look historically where we come from, what we think has worked that you can use in your programs, as well as um, what to do beyond getting the recognition that you'd get by getting to, um, to zero. So Botswana, like many of your countries, uh, has gone through multiple uh, public health emergencies over the years. We got our independence uh, from the UK in 1966. Around then, we were the second poorest country in the world. Malnutrition everywhere, no healthcare system, no infrastructure. Um, and since then, we have gone through uh, multiple pandemics, epidemics, um, as um, you all know. But each successive um, challenge we saw it as an opportunity to learn and use those lessons learned in the next pandemic. For example, in the first couple of decades after independence, we had a lot of issues with TB. So we developed a um, door-to-door -door program that uh, helped um, uh, deliver a TB treatment to clients at home. That built a system of public, a public health system that is at a grassroots and a, a, at a level where you go to the household. So using those lessons learned, when HIV hit us in the mid 80s to the mid 90s, that system was strengthened and used to deliver healthcare system and making sure that uh, all norms are nice left uh, behind. When COVID hit, we used those lessons from HIV now to address what are the emerging issues. So remember, we are dealing with two viruses with the silent transmission and all these other issues. So very many similarities that we now used to tackle COVID. So again, as we go through these challenges, we should be looking at how do we learn from them and use them uh, in our advantage uh, in the future. We anticipate the next major pandemic from uh, the coronavirus group. Multiple um, scientists have come up in the next couple of years. So we should not be caught unaware like what happened in 2019. It wasn't always easy, um, but what you need is to have everyone committed, everyone at the same table, and coming with solutions. Complex problems usually require a very comprehensive response. We were fortunate to have a willing political leadership, I think Jorgen talked to that in his last couple of slides, uh, who were out there and saying we need help, we're in trouble. At a time when a lot of political leaders were looking at the votes and saying we are going to say this is not a problem, right? So you need the right type of leadership. We divided our response in phases. So phase one, before treatment, all we could do was screening. Uh, phase two, mainly information, still no treatment. And then phase three, around the early 2000s is when treatment became largely available. But with the leadership that we have, we were able to actually invest in healthcare systems. But as usual, children lagged behind because we always, always go for those who actually can vote for the politicians that uh, decide where the money goes. Um, the lack of infrastructure, uh, complex treatment regimens, very expensive at the time, as you can imagine, the GDP uh, had dropped, uh, like um, the PEPFA ambassador mentioned uh, at the beginning of this conference. But we should not give up, because if you have a concerted plan, you can build the clinical infrastructure, you can build the critical human capacity, you can actually generate your own knowledge that you need to now respond appropriately to the pandemic. 
within each country, each unit, each um, uh, district or county is different from the next. So you need to fully understand your population if you are going to be able to respond to uh, the issue adequately. So the government over the years has taken a lot of effort in training the human capital that we lost during uh, HIV, the early HIV. But it's not just people that you need. You need the actual infrastructure. You need um, pharmaceuticals. You need diagnostics. You need to make sure that all of this are available so that your people can get access to treatment. And again, building on uh, the lessons learned with uh, the successive um, pandemics we've dealt with, we've managed to uh, have some successes. But just to give you a picture, Botswana is relatively small. It's one of the smallest populations on the continent, 2.4 million um, people, about 20% prevalence now. Um, Spectrum puts it at around 16% for 2022. Um, we have an, an advanced ARV program that covers uh, most of the, the country. But for you to get there, you need to make very difficult decisions. Sometimes, remember, you are making a decision of which bridge not to build uh, to treat people uh, who you don't know uh, what their outcomes are going to be. So you need everybody to be at the table to be able to uh, roll out uh, these types of uh, uh, programs. So right now, as of last year, again, we, we have reached the 95, 95, 95. But again, it's not without its own challenges. But um, I'll talk to that in the next couple of slides. So how did do this happen? It does, didn't happen in a, in a vacuum. You need a conducive environment if you are to deal with this. You are dealing with a stigmatized disease. Uh, people um, are not finding it easy to come to test. So your legal system, your healthcare system needs to be non-judgmental. It needs to be protective and all of that. We were not like that at the beginning. And uh, the next couple of slides will talk to that. But our uh, laws were changed over time to accommodate some of these new ideas that um, we're, we, we were struggling with. HIV-related services are provided primarily through a primary health care model. Like I talked about the TB program that taught us how to do that. We use that to build um, the HIV response in Botswana. The laws are archaic. Some of our laws are from 1885, right? So they have not been updated since then. But we are slowly reviewing. In the last year, we uh, started to review our constitution to see how do we uh, bring it up to, up to date. Many of these laws sometimes conflict with each other, so you need to know how to deal with them. Because if you don't have the right environment, you cannot deliver the right uh, type of uh, care that um, you wish to deliver. The Public Health Act tried to consolidate this, eliminate all the uh, issues of conflict between the laws, the constitution, the regulations, and all of that. But it's still a uh, work in progress. And I think uh, with the continued improvement, it will also continue to enable uh, delivery uh, of healthcare that is equitable um, and accessible. So like I said, you need to completely engage the community. In Setswana, we have a consultative type of leadership where the leader actually has to update the people, get their consent before we do anything. And that has trickled into how we respond to our problems by communicating, by sharing, being as honest as you can be, even when it's really bad, you have to tell people the, the truth. Because if you don't do that, then the trust in the healthcare system is going to hamper your success because um, people don't trust um, what you say. So building on decades of uh, public education and um, uh, getting um, excellent uh, representatives from the community, people living with HIV who are champions, um, getting tests out there, getting laboratory systems and all of that, I think we uh, were able to reach what uh, we are here celebrating today. It's not just that. Um, when we became independent, we really did not have any infrastructure. So the picture on the left is uh, our largest prince, uh, hospital, Princess Marina. This was in 1966. And they, with the successive decades of investment, we are now looking at uh, opening a much larger facility, which is on your right, with um, 
all of that. Again, intentional investment in healthcare. If your nation is not healthy, it's not going to be productive in terms of your economy and all of that. So there are many ways of justifying these types of investment um, in infrastructure. And trust me, um, if you arm your politicians with the right information, they will use that to get the resources um, for you. And like I said, you need a comprehensive um, uh, a program. With all of that, um, no infrastructure at the beginning, no laboratory systems. We, are, we have managed over the years, again, it didn't happen overnight, to invest in um, laboratory capacity, in training, and making sure that uh, people can test within the populations that they live in without having to move uh, long distances. And those are just the numbers on the right to show the investment in the laboratory uh, system. So you can imagine coming from, uh, apologies, I'm going the wrong way. How does it go back? Okay, I think I... Apologies. So coming from this two major laboratory investments and then going on to trying to reach as much as, uh, of the population as we can. This is 2022. So again, the problem that we have, we have a small population, but the country is quite large. It's the size of Kenya or France or Texas for, for the Americans and the crowd. It means we have three to four people per square kilometer. So trying to capture people where they are without having them inconvenienced by moving long distances has been a costly exercise. But again, making concerted effort in making sure that uh, people get um, uh, health care wherever they are is important. As we build that system, we're also building the referral system through the network. And this works for both patients and samples from the different uh, parts of the country. The third part is uh, investment in the um, healthcare system that was uh, led by data that we had at the time. Um, over the years, uh, we've invested a lot in different types of uh, regimen, as you can see them. This is good um, and bad. Bad in that uh, you now have uh, a treatment experience population, meaning that you need the most advanced, the most optimal, the most robust drugs that um, you need to be looking at. We are currently, um, we started DTG 2016 as a, at the national program level, and we are currently looking at TAF-ED, uh, we are looking at um, uh, um, uh, um, injectables as well, uh, dual treatment, all of that. What is the most optimum way, and um, Dr. Raulat, who is here, We'll be talking to that a bit more uh, tomorrow. It wasn't all easy. The law, the legal side, which is uh, the setting that we work in, has not been um, easy. Um, in terms of criminalization of certain things that uh, lead to um, increased transmission, uh, sex work, uh, drug use, we are still struggling. We've had our own little successes in our little ways, I think incremental, um, uh, no major shifts. Um, it's important to uh, do that over time. Uh, we've seen uh, the decriminalization of the actual homosexuality in the last couple of years. It was not easy, it took decades of work to work with the population and get them consensus. We still have to struggle to work with sex work and uh, to struggle to work with um, the transmission, but the successes we celebrate and we show the nation as to why we are reaching some of these milestones and use that energy to now negotiate um, the remaining law reform that um, we need to have in, in, in Botswana. So as we look at the last mile from the perspective of a high burden country, um, 10, 15 years ago, I would have said it's probably not possible uh, to reach where we are. But I think with a concerted effort and energy, you are, it, it is possible. Um, like I said at the beginning of this talk, it's only possible if you plan for it, use the lessons learned from uh, earlier um, uh, diseases that we dealt with, to now uh, contain vertical transmission, which is um, what we're discussing today. 
it needed to take an act of parliament to set up uh, the PMTCT program. Again, now you are giving it uh, the strength and the teeth to be able to be implemented um, because it has been agreed at the highest level of, um, of, 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 of government. It, you also needed to do it in a phased manner. So you learn as, as you, you, you do that, you correct the, the problems that you identify and then move on to the full scale where you are now comfortable that you are delivering um, um, uh, the service from all health facilities, again with a primary health care model in mind. The goal, um, I think we are all aware, this was in 2011, we aimed for less than 1% by 2024, uh, we have achieved that. Um, the strategies used, I think most of you here would be aware of um, this um, uh, systems. I've, I was listening to different presentations over this weekend in the pre-conference uh, meeting, and we are all doing exactly the same things. But you need to do them with fidelity, you need to monitor, you need to collect data, and make sure that where you have gaps, you close them so that um, you can get the desired um, um, results that you want. Uh, PCR, we're still struggling uh, with uh, point of care. Uh, we are working with uh, and consulting with our government colleagues, lab, uh, community as to how to optimally use point of care in our system. Breastfeeding, um, with the introduction of DTG in 2016, um, we have now encouraged and liberalized the uh, breastfeeding option for women. It has always been their, their choice as to how they uh, decide to uh, feed their, their children. Remember, they have be become from 30 years of uh, indoctrination with breastfeeding. So now trying to reverse that will take um, a lot of energy and a lot of um, uh, planning. Care and support, so again, bringing health care services to the people is quite important. Um, and because of that, we were able to, around 2015 or so, drop below 2% transmission uh, from mother to child. All of that investment has led to what you are seeing now. So it, it just didn't happen um, uh, overnight. So by 2016, we were less than 1% um, 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 uh, transmission. So our plan um, with the certification that we've just got uh, is to aim for gold and beyond. Because like you said, um, the uh, Lancet paper that talked about uh, no child should be positive is what we are actually aiming for. But you need to do it in stages. You cannot do it all at once. So to do that, we decided to go for the validation, uh, WHO validation, uh, to be on the path to elimination. As most of you will know, uh, it was a difficult decision to reach at first because everybody doubted that uh, we had reached these numbers. The important thing is that a lot of places actually are much, much closer than they think. It's just that uh, our data is all over the place. It's in notebooks somewhere, it's in files and all these other things. So we need to digitize and get all our data so that um, we can actually um, get validated. It's a huge task involving a lot of people, both in country, regionally and um, internationally as well. It covers a lot of things, but again, it's possible. So don't let this scare you. Uh, they look at governance, they look at costing, they look at data quality, lab quality, human rights, and they also um, support you with uh, issues as they come up. Um, any country looking to do it, I would encourage you to continue and do it because if you don't qualify, you have started the process of analyzing what your issues are and use that to incrementally um, um, uh, improve your system and you will get um, validated at some, at some point. And these are just the different um, um, uh, 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 validations that you can get while you're on the path to elimination. So the process is not simple and straightforward, but there's a lot of help from our WHO colleagues and other partners on the ground, including PEPFAR. It took us four years to get to that stage uh, because there was a lot of uh, data verification, um, a lot of collation of data that was not talking to each other before, and all of that, again, is possible. Um, a lot of places when you look at um, 
your data, you would think that you, you don't qualify. But I want to encourage you to start the process. So with that, um, in the last couple of years, we managed to actually get this um, uh, silver tier, um, and that was our president receiving that. We use that now as leverage to get more support for these programs. So again, every little step uh, celebrated so that now you can use it as leverage on your side to achieve um, what you want to achieve. Lessons learned, again, there's no need to reinvent uh, the wheel. Um, you need to look at your neighbors. Um, they are all willing to help. Let's, uh, let's work together to get this done. It doesn't make sense for only one country to get the validation. It's more important if all of us uh, get that validation. Depend on science, use data. Um, it will actually tell the story uh, of uh, what you, the investment that you have put uh, through. Sometimes we are stopped from thinking about this because of our own biases, but data doesn't lie. Um, strong political support, I think, is important. You need that. Uh, you need the leadership to be able to actually uh, support you through. They are going to find you resources. Our program is about 70% funded by the government um, for the HIV program. It would be important for them to also advocate for with their other counterparts in other countries. We've seen Kenya come through. We are having the same negotiations. We are looking at our other neighbors to say invest more in healthcare. It will yield dividends in the, in the future. Um, building trust in the public system is very important because otherwise you are going to be um, um, fighting a losing battle because people will not come to you. Uh, we heard this morning when they were talking about uh, you are designing things without us. So we are, it's your program, not our program. So you need to build the trust in the system. And then um, you need the right strategies that are based on data and uh, science. As I wrap up um, uh, by stealing one minute of your time, I think uh, it's important that uh, you focus on uh, the goal. You can reach it before uh, the 2030 that is uh, scheduled. Um, have ambitious plans and have a, a robust plan. You will surprise yourself as, as to what you can achieve. And then continuously look at uh, new strategies that will lead us to um, um, the validation that we, we so desire. We are currently now looking at sustaining and maintaining the validation and working on improving our systems. And I would like to thank uh, the following uh, people, mainly WHO, Ministry of Health, partners uh, such as PEPFA that have been with us from the beginning, and then the validation committee, regional and international. Thank you.